So I'm going to talk a little bit about my book today. Um, but the book came at a, an interesting time because about 18 months, maybe two years ago, something happened. Um, Beijing became much more assertive in international relations. Some people even say aggressive in international relations. And we can see this in various places. We saw it um, at the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference in uh, 2009, where China upset Europe, especially for blocking various measures. Um, and you can see it in China's renewed territorial problems with uh, its neighbors in East Asia and Southeast Asia. And then today in Washington at the uh, Strategic Economic, is it the Strategic and Economic Dialogue in Washington, they'll be talking about the exchange rate, which is another big deal, not just for the U.S., but actually for almost every country in the world is now complaining about China's um, exchange rate. And what is interesting about this is that it came as a surprise to a lot of us because for the past 10 years, people have been analyzing Chinese diplomacy and seeing Chinese diplomacy as becoming more and more like Western diplomacy, that China is being socialized into international norms. And Ian Johnston's book, Social States, which came out in 2008, was a very good analysis of it, about how Chinese diplomats, by working in international institutions, had kind of learned how to be uh, diplomats in a new way, a more familiar way to people in the West. But I think that what happened, whatever happened uh, one or two years ago, should give us pause and reconsider this socialization argument. Um, and I think that part of it is a transition. China is in the midst of various transitions. It's in the midst of transition from laying low on the international stage to asserting itself as the newest major power or even the newest great power. Um, we can see this transition in official policy statements, but we can also see it in China's and how China's public intellectuals um, and popular culture are dealing with the world in new ways, addressing the rest of the world in new ways. Um, there's much talk about the Chinese century. There's much talk about the China model and the China dream. Um, so to understand China and its new relation to the world, today I'll, I'll offer six uh, pro propositions or proposals about how we, we can understand China. Um, my goal is to talk about China policy, um, but in a broad sense. Uh, we'll ta I'll talk a little bit how the American government deals with China, but I think we also need to think of China policy as something much broader about how businesses deal with China, how universities deal with China, and how individuals like us deal with China. So I think this is kind of fits in with one of the um, USCI's uh, projects from last summer, when it coordinated the, the American students who went to the Shanghai Expo last year, they were all ambassadors uh, to China. And I think that we're all ambassadors too whenever we deal with Chinese people and Chinese institutions. So that's how I'm framing uh, policy. And my first proposition is that we need to take culture and history seriously as part of China's national and international security politics. Uh, most international relations scholars see cultural issues as a distraction from the real politics of economic strength and military force. Uh, but I think that the opening ceremony of Beijing Summer Olympics shows how identity performances can tell us much about the political direction of China's rise. Uh, so if you remember, in August 2008, the world's gaze focused on China, on Beijing in particular, and what it saw through these grand performances and, and spectacular fireworks was the birth of a new superpower. And it, this new superpower emerged in a novel way through a stunning cultural performance as opposed to emerging through a decisive military victory, which is how the U.S. emerged as a superpower through a decisive military victory after World War II. Um, so China and uh, Chinese policy insists that uh, the PRC is peacefully rising in a new and different way to be a status quo power that, rather than a revisionist state. Um, but I find that there are lots of other voices, especially in Beijing, um, that are pushing in different directions that often challenge uh, the international system and challenge Chinese policy. Uh, so what my book does is it takes culture seriously 
as a site of international politics. And it does this by tracing the links between uh, identity and security in China. And what I do is I kind of shift from the common way in international relations of framing these issues. I shift from looking at it as a security dilemma between rival military powers to see China involved in an identity dilemma. And this is a phrase that comes from one of my Chinese colleagues, Qin Yaqing, um, in one of his um, kind of central essays that said that we have to think of Chinese uh, foreign policy differently. And one of the things that he and others have been saying is that we have to think about what it means to be Chinese and how, what it means for China to fit into the world. So don't, he doesn't look at the WTO, look at how China fits into international institutions. He looks at uh, identity performances like the, uh, the Olympics. And the key here um, in my book is to try to avoid a, a culturalist approach that um, often reproduces essentialized identities of East versus West. Um, and my, my goal is to have a critical appreciation of the variety of identity in China. There's a lot of different identities uh, that, are, that are each saying that they're Chinese. And that's, I think, I think that's very interesting to look at. Okay. Second proposal is that we should extend our analysis beyond official text to see foreign affairs as an everyday activity among elites, academics, and the general public. Most analysts focus on China's new multilateralism and China's peaceful rise. But since these themes are not deeply embedded in Chinese society, I think we also need to look beyond official policy <coughs> to see how Chinese people relate to the world. This is important because opinion makers in the PRC often go against Beijing's stated policy of peaceful multilateralism. Uh, so here, foreign affairs expands to encompass social activities uh, where people divide friends from enemies in everyday life as well as in the halls of power. Um, we thus need to widen the scope of our analysis to include unofficial texts in academic and popular culture. So in addition to analyzing official texts from the foreign and defense ministries, uh, we also need to analyze Chinese film, TV, blogs, uh, novels, and so on. And the idea is to understand the interplay between state policy <coughs> and popular culture. So I guess what I'm thinking of here is this is a, a label from a, a mineral water bottle that I got at the Yuan Yuan. And I was thinking this is very interesting that they have ruins, the icon of uh, national humiliation in China, on a water bottle label. And I'm probably over-interpreting, but um, I think that we can understand this as, as foreign policy. Drinking this patriotic mineral water means that you're engaging in foreign policy, that you're dividing friends from enemies uh, in everyday life as you, as you quench your thirst. And my next example is some playing cards I also got at the Yuan Ming Yuan. And to, to push this even further, to push it to its bursting point, I would say that you're engaging in foreign policy when you play cards with these, uh, these playing cards, when you're playing poker. The third proposal is that Chinese foreign policy is not a stable entity. Uh, it's not a thing that we can capture and describe. It's a dynamic process that juggles different ideas. Um, right now we see different things being juggled. There's socialism, there's capitalism, there's Confucianism. These are all being um, employed at the same time in different combinations. <clears throat> and my main argument is that Chinese foreign policy grows out of a, a dynamic like this, but more, more of a positive-negative dynamic. Uh, while many analyze China by looking at pairs of opposites, like East and West, politics and economics, domestic and foreign, hard and soft power, and they argue that one, one side, one factor can help explain the other, so that economic development, for example, uh, guides the politics of foreign policy. But when I've been looking at Chinese discussions of what's going on in the PRC, I see something else going on. I see how these contradictory elements are often interwoven, that the PRC's national security is closely tied to its nationalist insecurities, that domestic politics and foreign policy are overlapping, that soft and power are producing each other, 
and that elite and mass are intertwined. Uh, so to understand this complex dynamic, <coughs> I think we need to not try to solve it and say that uh, one side is the answer and the other side is not as important. I think what we need to do is <coughs> to look at the creative tension between these opposites to see how one defines the other in a mix of positive and negative images. The book thus argues that China is a pessimist nation. Uh, to understand China's uh, glowing optimism, we need to understand its enduring pessimism and vice versa. Rather than being opposites, in China, pride and humiliation are interwoven. This is another quote from another Chinese scholar. They're interwoven, separated only by a fine line that can easily trade places, unquote. China thus, I think, can shift, and we've seen this, can shift very quickly from positive optimism uh, to negative pessimistic actions and back again very quickly. So to understand China's current triumphalism, I think it's necessary to appreciate the politics of humiliation. So how can we understand these radical shifts between celebration and protest and between cooperation and conflict? My fourth proposal, as you can see, the, the Yuan Ming Yuan keeps coming back again and again. Uh, my fourth proposal is that to understand Chinese nationalism, in Chinese foreign policy, we need to <clears throat> understand pessimism as what, what some call a structure of feeling. The structure of feeling sets the template for both domestic and international politics. Um, lots of people talk about emotional nationalism as a problem and rational nationalism as the solution, as if you can separate reason and emotion so easily. Um, but I think that the idea of structure of feeling is useful because um, it enables us to take emotions seriously uh, and account for how people express them in social structures and through networks. Um, in this way, we can better understand how reason and emotion interact in official and popular culture. So in the, in the book, I argue that China has two interrelated structures of feeling that we need to pay attention to. The first is the outcome of a propaganda policy uh, that was the response to the Tiananmen pro-democracy movement in 1989. After the June 4th crackdown, Deng Xiaoping, at various meetings, the two meetings in, in particular, Deng Xiaoping concluded that the democratic uprising was the result of a failure in China's propaganda system. So it wasn't about democracy, it was about propaganda and how, whether it was working properly. Um, so Deng's solution was to have to more deliberately and more rigorously teach China's youth about the proper way to be a patriotic Chinese person. And now it's extended since then to teach everyone through mass media how to be, how to be patriotic. The result was a new patriotic education policy that has been implemented at all levels of education as well as in the mass media including museums, feature films, TV and radio programs. Patriotic education teaches students to take pride in China's glorious civilization, but it also includes a dose of what they call national humiliation education, um, which commemorates China's defeats between the Opium War in 1840 and the Communist Revolution in 1949. The century of national humiliation is written as a moral tale, uh, and what it does is it knits together all the negative events, the invasions, massacres, unequal treaties, and so on, of China's pre-revolutionary history, especially those that can be blamed on outsiders. Patriotic, patriotic education thus looks to a combination of national pride and national humiliation to teach people that China is peaceful and civilized while foreigners are violent and barbaric. Uh, this is not simply a history lesson. <clears throat> it tells people that the PRC still needs to defend itself against a hostile world. In conversations with Chinese students over the past few years, um, confirm that national humiliation is now the common sense way of understanding China's modern history. It's not just about the past, it sets the template for a contentious understanding of international politics in the present and also for the future. Uh, so my argument, my argument is not that China's youth go around every day cursing America or cursing Japan, um, which, I, which I would agree that most don't. Rather, what I'm saying is that patriotic education themes come into play 
uh, whenever there's a crisis, that whenever there's a, a military crisis or an economic crisis or a uh, social crisis, um, national humiliation themes and language and slogans uh, kind of come to the surface. Uh, this is because the national humiliation discourse, the narrative of national humiliation, has set the template for how people understand China's relation to the world. My fifth proposal <coughs> is that Chinese nationalism is more complex than state propaganda that the party elite uses to manipulate the people. <coughs> that China's pessimist structure of feeling has deep roots in pre-modern understandings of civilization and barbarism. Uh, Beijing's current patriotic education campaign is successful, and it's, it's seen as the most successful campaign in, in uh, the PRC's history. It's successful because it builds on a structure of feeling that precedes this particular propaganda policy and predates the PRC. That was a lot of P words in one sentence. <clears throat> in the book, I, uh, I show how national pride and national humiliation, this distinction between them, it grows out of another distinction, civilization barbarism distinction, that served as the governing ideology in imperial China. Here, civilization is more than Confucian aphorisms or Ming vases. Um, civilization is better understood as a discourse that takes shape in relation to its opposite, uh, namely barbarism. So whenever we declare something civilized, we're simultaneously declaring something else barbaric or drawing a line. Like in the West, because Western empires did this as well, this is Orientalism, civilization discourse here involves drawing important political and moral distinctions, uh, distinctions between inside and outside, between domestic and foreign, China and the West, and between pride and humiliation. <coughs> Classical Chinese texts, if you look at them, are full of passages that stress these kind of distinctions. Um, honor the king by expelling the barbarians is a very popular classical idiom. Um, and now idioms like never forget national humiliation, rejuvenate China are very popular as well. This mix of entitlement and anger is very strong in China because it draws on self-understandings that are both very ancient and very modern. Uh, Chinese identity emerges in an interactive process that appeals to both modern victimization and ancient civilization. In this way, the party state gains legitimacy not only through economic prosperity, but through a form of nationalism that unites diverse groups, kind of country and city, for example, device, device groups of people as Chinese, um, and often against the West, and especially in times of crisis. Uh, I guess I should explain these maps. This is actually a Korean map, a Tianxia All Under Heaven map, but it's a very good example of the Sinocentric world order of civilization is at the center, and as you, the farther away you get, the more barbaric uh, you're seen. This is a, as it says, a map of China's national humiliation from 1927 published by, I think, the commercial press. It was a big map, probably about as larger than it is here. Uh, it was for instruction in classrooms. And in one of the chapters of the book, I argue that these two maps have the same hierarchical logic of China at the center, and all these territories are naturally Chinese, but they've been taken away uh, by other empires. Or for uh, Thailand, Siam, it says it was taken away by independence. Uh, <laughs> so. What's the date of that? Uh, 1927. Okay. This is actually, I translated it, uh, and it lists all the, so it's a, a list of lost territories. And most of these territories are now uh, independent nation states. So this map is, is interesting because it shows this sort of overlap between imperial notions of, of order and space, imperial domain, and sovereign territory. Because this outer blue line is listed up here as the old national boundary. It doesn't say old Qing boundary or old imperial boundary. It's the old national boundary. If I wanted that slide, the other no, picture. Okay. No, Taiwan is A15. Yeah. What is interesting is that it doesn't actually have the South China Sea. 
uh, line. It doesn't go all the way down. But it, yeah, this is a very expansive map. There are ones that are even larger, but this one is, uh, I guess, the most photogenic. And my sixth and last proposal is that um, the most important thing to understand about China's pest optimism is that it's fundamentally unstable and it produces shifting feelings. Again, in reading a lot of commentaries uh, over the past few years, there was words uh, talking about shifting feelings and unease and being uncomfortable uh, are very, very common. And I think that there's this strong sense in China of uh, aspiration and anxiety going together uh, that you see even more uh, in the past few years with China's recent successes. Um, so I think this is unstable and that any time uh, China's pest optimist nationalism can spill over into mass movements to target domestic critics, foreigners, and even the party state itself. This is ironic since stability is the Chinese government's main objective. Uh, patriotic education was created uh, as domestic blowback, uh, or it has created a domestic blowback in that it was created to stabilize the situation uh, after what was seen as a very big crisis of domestic order. But now this patriotic education is creating disorder. Um, and it's very hard now for the party state to manage um, the uh, kind of patriotic education and national humiliation themes because it's been so successful that people have internalized it and now go much farther than the uh, party state might want them to. <clears throat> well, it's necessary to treat China as a great power in the international community um, and encourage more moderate voices in Beijing. I think the most important thing to recognize is that no one can really control uh, these identity politics in China, not the party, not the state, and not the intellectual elite. In many ways, the situation comes from a disjuncture in China's view of itself. Um, there's lots of talk in Beijing about soft power and improving China's national image, especially improving its image abroad. Um, but when you think of a national, if there is such a thing as a national image, what does China see when it looks in the mirror? I think that the the national image that uh, it sees is both too small when it calls itself a poor developing country and too large when it sees itself as the next superpower. Um, so what I see going on is that the perceptions and capabilities are out of sync um, and that this can warp both official policy and popular feelings, popular culture. This disjuncture between grand ambitions and kind of middling capabilities um, I think could lead to conflict because Beijing is promising its citizens much more than it can deliver in terms of global power and influence. So complex international incidents in this context um, thus often are read according to grand zero-sum <coughs> geopolitical logic that reduces the complexity of Chinese identity to stereotypes of a virtuous East versus, versus an immoral West. Um, this, if you want to call it a gap, everybody likes to talk about like a wealth gap in China. I think we could call this a propaganda gap. This propaganda gap, I think, is likely to increase tensions between China and the West in the next <coughs> few years um, because populist voices are demanding a post-American world order and they're growing and they're getting louder, especially in the past year, year and a half. And they're getting, they're getting louder because China is involved in a, another transition. It's involved in the transition of leadership to the fifth generation of leaders that will assume power when Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao retire in 2012. Uh, thus, in a way, I think that uh, the U.S. has to be pessimistic pess about China as well. I think that uh, if we can avoid characters of panda hugging and China bashing um, and soberly focus on important issues, that's the best thing to do. Focus on things like climate change, uh, the global economy, human rights, and nuclear nonproliferation. Um, 
think although diplomats and NGOs um, should continue to work in all these issue areas, it's important to recognize that it's not possible to succeed on all, in all, all areas. Um, so the U.S. needs to prioritize these issues according to its own values, formulate a set of objectives, and then stick to them. And not just do it as official diplomats, but do it as part of a broad conversation of person-to-person uh, -person diplomacy as well. I think we also need <clears throat> a new approach to how we talk about China and international politics. Um, it's necessary to understand how Chinese elites use national humiliation and Chinese civilization as a template to frame international politics, and that's why I wrote this book, to try and understand uh, the logic. But in the book I show how the century of national humiliation is not really a set of facts. It's a structure of feeling that guides a certain form of politics. Um, so while, while we, encourage Chinese, we encourage China to move beyond national humiliation discourse, um, it's also necessary for Western commentators to avoid using the phrase national humiliation, as many do, like it's a historical fact that can explain Chinese actions. Um, we need to understand national humiliation not because it's true, but because understanding it is helpful for exiting this particular narrative of international politics, which I see as a hostile narrative of international politics. I think it, it significantly narrows um, the possibilities for China and its relation uh, to the world. So if we think back to the 2008 Olympics and the Shanghai, Shanghai Expo last year, it showed us how happy and hospitable uh, Chinese people can be, especially welcoming the world to China. <clears throat> but since Beijing tends to personalize international politics, other countries need to be prepared for harsh popular reactions um, whenever China hits a bump on its road of political and economic change. And I guess I go to uh, the, the sage uh, Stephen Colbert to understand this. And I think he said it best when he satirically described China as a frenemy, both a friend and an enemy, kind of a pest optimist frenemy. Um, and I think that that's not just a, he was talking about the way America sees China. I think that it's also helpful to think about how China sees itself and how it sees the rest of the world. That it's, it's also a frenemy, that frenemy and pest optimist go together. If I could think of a clever way to put them all together that was pronounceable, I would. And I think I'll stop there, and uh, I think we'll have some questions. <laughs>